Now it's my pleasure to introduce Sébastien Bro, who is an associate professor in the Department of Geography at McGill. He completed a master in economics at Université Laval and a PhD in geography at the University of California, Los Angeles. He has worked as an economist with the Conference Board of Canada and as a research associate of the, at the Canadian Institute for Research on Regional Development. His research seeks to understand recent geographies of inequality and precarious employment. More specifically, his research program aims first to identify and analyze spatial, spatial patterns of inequality in, across North America and European region and to understand which factors lie behind these patterns. Sebastian? Okay, merci Céline pour l'introduction. Um, what I would like to do in my remar remarks today is say a few words about some of the work that I've been doing on the geographical dimensions of inequality in Canada. And for this kind of work, there is no substitute to the mandatory long-form census, right? It is the most uh, important source of information available to geographers, urban planners, social scientists, uh, policy makers, in terms of uh, the spatial details that it contains. It is thus a great relief uh, that the long-form census is coming alive again, right? So uh, for the last five or so years, every time I participated in a panel discussion such as this one, or in conversations about the long-form census, it felt more like a wake than anything else. Uh, it's nice to see the winds now uh, changing uh, direction. As a geographer, I'm very much interested in why place matters, right? Broadly speaking, this means I'm interested in the relationships between people and their environment, right? In terms of uh, where uh, the society in which they le live. Alan Pred, writing about social and spatial transformations in Sweden back in the 19th century, would have argued this is something like how the social becomes the spatial and the spatial becomes the social. More specifically, as a geographer interested in questions of inequality, my main concern is about who gets what, where, and how, right? So following the Occupy movement of 2011, we've heard a lot about the increase in income inequality over the last two decades or so. And in describing or studying this increase, right, economists and sociologists, with all due respect to my esteemed colleagues here, have tended to focus on the who question, right, in terms of inequality across occupational classes or ethnic or other groups. The where question typically is overlooked, right, in terms of place-to-place -place differences in inequality. Yet what I would argue is that a geographical perspective can actually tell us a lot, not only about the changes in terms of the spatial patterns of inequality, but shed light in terms of what the causes of those changes may be, but also in terms of the consequences, right, in terms of negative social health, environmental, and social outcomes. And of course, all of this is very important from a policy-making point of view in terms of figuring out what the right policy mix might be, right? Ian used the term place-based versus person-based type policies. We'll come back to this later on. To get a sense of how that geographical perspective may be important, what I'd like to do over the next few slides is just go through some of those maps that we've been working on over the last few years to give you a flavor of that changing landscape in terms of inequality across the country. So what we have here, right, is the evolution of earnings and equality across regions in Canada from 1996 to 2006. Now regions here are essentially defined as census divisions. These are large counties if you prefer, right? What we've done with the census microdata files is, be, uh, is being able to reconstruct those boundaries so that they're consistent over time. Now in the red, what you have are regions which have experienced above average growth in terms of inequality over that 10 year period. And in the darker blue shaded areas, we have regions that have experienced uh, below average growth in inequality. And clearly as you're scanning across the country, 
you see a divide between eastern and western regions, right? Inequality is typically much higher, growing more rapidly in western regions compared to eastern regions where inequality tends to be lower and more stable, right? There are pockets of high income inequality in southern Ontario and a few other outliers, but the primary divide is that east-west divide. If we look at what's going on within the urban hierarchy, we also see some interesting spatial trends here, right? So here we have the darker shaded uh, circles representing cities with higher levels of inequality in 2006, the lighter shaded area, lower levels of inequality, and of course the size of the circle tells us something about the population size of the city. So there are two things that really stand out here. One, we can again see that east-west divide. If you look at all of the cities in Alberta and in British Columbia, with the exception of Victoria, these are all very high inequality cities, right, compared to their eastern provinces' counterparts. The second thing is that we also see some relationship in terms of inequality and the size of a city. Typically, cities with larger populations with, will have higher levels of inequality compared to smaller sized cities. And if we drill further down, we can also use the mandatory long form census to say something about how the spatial morphology of inequality may be changing within cities themselves. So here we have an example on the left hand side, right, of census tracts across the city of Montreal. So in the red, we have higher income neighborhoods, right? And so if we look at where these are located, we're going to see that the West Island communities are typically uh, high income neighborhoods. We have Westmount and parts of Saint Laurent, et cetera. And in the blue shaded area, we have those lower income neighborhoods, which typically are concentrated in the eastern parts of the island of Montreal, right? If you would imagine a similar map, right, for 1991, then we can also track the movement or the trajectories of these census tracts and how they change over time. And this is what we've done in the right-hand circular histogram here. There are four quadrants, right? So essentially all we're doing here is counting each census tract, right, in terms of where they are 15 years later. Are they relatively richer or relatively poorer compared to their starting point back in 1991? And as you can see, there are two quadrants which dominate, right? Most census tracts or neighborhoods find themselves in this particular quadrant, which is where we have census tracts that are relatively richer over time, or in this lower left-hand quadrant, right? So what we have is a growing spatial polarization, a pulling apart, if you will, of spatial inequality within the city of Montreal. Now this pattern is also one that we find in most other large urban centers, Toronto, Calgary, Vancouver, uh, and to some extent even Ottawa. Now you'll notice that all of the maps that I've shown so far use 1990 or 2006 data. I have avoided the 2011 census so far, or the survey, right, for the reasons that we're all familiar with lack of quality or the response rate is lower, questions regarding the quality of the income data, and also the fact that for a very large number of communities, the data was simply not published because of high non-response rates, right? So what I would want to do here just to show what happens and how geography can be of use in terms of looking at those quality, uh, data quality issues is go through a simple exercise where I have a little animation focusing on the province of Quebec, right? And we're going to be looking at those low income inequality regions again and how they have evolved from 1981 through to 2011, right? And as we're shuffling through these maps, remember that the blue shaded areas are low income inequality regions, okay? So let's start with the map for 1981, right? So lots of blue as would be expected, similar pattern in 1991, 2001, 2006, and then 2011, right? So the picture is drastically different than what it was with previous generations of the mandatory long-form census. Now, of course, we all know this is related in large part to the fact that there are a lot of missing communities in Quebec, 183, I think, for which data was actually not published 
Uh, and that explains to a large uh, portion what is going on. And by the way, uh, the Institut Statistique de Québec has done some really interesting work using Quebec's tax file revenues and comparing that in 2011 to the income tax data or the uh, income data in the 2011 NHS. And they find that same inverse relationship between the quality of the income data reported in the NHS and the level of geography, right? So when we go to smaller communities, there's a lot of missing observations as we would expect. Okay, so just to sum things up, right? It's a big relief that the 2016 census is coming back. Now we have to deal with the data gap, right? I think it's going to be very important to revisit, once we have that data, a lot of these divides to see if they are still persisting, right? And also to try and identify the drivers to get a better idea of whether or not it's because of the industrial composition, right? Uh, the unemployment, the education, the ethnic composition, or the age profile of regions that we see these patterns in uh, spatial inequality. And of course, this brings us back to the optimal policy mix, right? Thinking about how we move forward to promote more inclusive uh, 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 growth in terms of what approach is best, person-based or policy-based approaches. Thank you. <laughs>